الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد When you look back at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you reflect about the concept of art and beauty, aesthetics, you find that it, it's very rich and we have some restrictions. Those restrictions that we have with regards to art, uh, primarily depicting animate objects, animate beings, we're not allowed to depict animate beings, so that's animals or human beings in terms of creating a form. Uh, there, there's some difference of opinion whether it has to be whether the prohibition is related to a 3D object like a statue or even a 2D drawing or inscription or uh, some other kind of manifestation of that nature. But that has never actually stopped the Muslims from uh, expressing themselves in their art. And that's why if you look around, you'll see that in many of the Muslim countries, including places like India is a very good example, the Indian subcontinent. Some of the best art in India, and I've seen a lot of it, is primarily Muslim, though they've always been a minority in the Indian subcontinent. Muslims have always been a minority. I mean, um, they are millions. There's, there's, more, there's more Muslims in India just India right now, not even talking about Pakistan or Bangladesh or Burma. But in India, there's nearly 200 million Muslims or so, or probably more than that, which is more than the Muslims in the Middle East, right? And uh, they don't even speak Arabic. They read Arabic. And then when you take Pakistan and then Bangladesh, and that's, that's another, you know, that, that's, an, that, that's maybe like 500 million or something like that. That's, that's a huge amount of Muslims we're talking about. The, Pro, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah jameelun wa yuhibbul jamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is elegant, Allah is beautiful, and He loves beauty and elegance. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. The Prophet ﷺ also said that Allah has written, prescribed, He's prescribed beauty in everything, excellence. The word ihsan is used there. So we've got jamal. Jamal means beauty and excellent, uh, and beauty and elegance. Then you've got ihsan. Ihsan is a transitive, uh, a transitive form of the word husn. Husn means beauty. It means beauty. It means something that is nice, something that is great, something that is attractive. Ihsan means to make something good and attractive. So the Prophet sallallahu said that God has, Allah has written, has prescribed, has instructed that things be done in an excellent way. And when we're talking about excellence, we mean everything. It doesn't have to be just a form as a purely a form of art, but worship, uh, a person's character, a person's state, a person's self. That's why in the very famous narration from the Prophet wasallam, where Jibreel wasallam, was specially sent for this occasion, that he came and sat in front of the Prophet wasallam. Most of you would have heard of that narration. It's a very famous one. And he asked a series of questions, really simple questions, really. And this happened in the final years, towards the end of the Prophet wasallam's life. And he came and asked some very simple questions. First question he asked was, what is Islam? Right? It's not like, People didn't know. They knew what Islam was, but he asked that question, what is Islam? And the Prophet ﷺ gave him a simple answer. What is Iman, Ya Rasulullah? What is faith? So he, he differentiated between, distinguished between Islam and Iman. And while the words can be used interchangeably, Islam, Iman, Mu'min, Muslim, the, the real difference between them is that one is inner, and the other one is an outer expression. So Iman generally refers to belief inside the heart. It means the inner conviction, the inner belief. And the outside manifestation when you declare that you're a, you believe in God and you believe that Muhammad is Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, pray, you, you fast and so on. The five pillars, they're basically an expression of Islam. But Iman is the core, the inner conviction. So those two are very simple questions. And you've got some of the prominent companion sitting around when this exchange took place. I think it was just to re-gravitate, re-acclimate people, just 
get back into focus. Because by now, so many smaller rulings had been revealed as well and had been explicated and uh, spread within the Muslim community. So this was just like, okay, what is Islam? What is Iman? And then the last question the Prophet ﷺ was asked by Jibreel is, what is Ihsan? What is perfection of faith? What is the excellence in faith? How do you reach perfection in Islam and Iman? That's how I, uh, that's how I, uh, how I would interpret it. The Islam and Iman we just talked about, how do you make that excellent? And that's where the Prophet ﷺ gave an answer, that you try to worship Allah, that you do worship Allah as though you're seeing Him. So God needs to be in your mind and your heart manifest when you worship Him. It needs to be a very conscious form of worship, not just ritualistic. Ritual is important for us to be unified, for us to go through a procedure, for us to be able to understand how to do things. If we were told, you just need to be conscious of God, just, just pray to God, just be conscious of God, just remember God, do some dhikr. We weren't told how to do it. Then people would have come up with some really crazy ideas and then shaitan would have misled a lot of people to, he would have just totally hijacked that whole idea. So we are told how to pray. Uh, some, some of those prayers are made obligatory, some are made optional, so that we, are, we have an idea of how to at least enact the form of it. But what is really important is to have the consciousness within to really understand that you're standing in front of God. Not just in our prayer then, that's just the prayers are just the form of training, but at every point in our time, in our life, that wherever we may be, whether we're sitting in class, whether we're shopping, we are worried about how we can be the perfect human being. That's in our interaction to others. That's in our interaction with our Lord. So we're remembering our Lord and that helps us to fulfill the rights of other people because that is what's going to cut the selfishness, the arrogance to want to feel that you are closer to God. So even when you're in a marketplace, even when you go shopping, you just go step into Tesco or Sainsbury's or whatever to buy something. The incentive that's been given to us in a hadith that's related in the sunan, the Prophet ﷺ said whoever goes into a marketplace or a souk, a bazaar, a shopping area, whatever it is, and says, La ilaha illallah, وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتُ وَهُوَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتُ بِيَدِهِ الْخَيْرُ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ I mean a lot of people know this too already. If you read that, you get, this is one of the highest rewarding dhikrs that you can do in any place. You get a million rewards for this. Just being in a shop where you're obviously focused on shopping, you're being dazzled by everything around you. But God is, Allah, the, uh, the Prophet is saying that if you remember God then, then you get this many rewards. That's an incentive. But the purpose is that we remember God wherever we are. So excellence, that's another narration that God has prescribed excellence in everything. Yet another narration is when the Prophet was approached by a particular, a particular person who was very handsome. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Look, Ya Rasulullah, I want to ask you a question. You've seen how handsome I am, right? Meaning, you've seen how much beauty that I've been endowed with, right? I've been bestowed with, right? And I like everything about me to be excellent. To the straps of my sandals, right? I want everything, you know, I want my clothing, my handbag. I mean, he didn't have a handbag, but you know what I mean, right? So I want all of these things to be just excellent. I can't stand for anything less. I just don't want Louis Vuitton though. Because <laughs> right? I don't want to be promoting the company. They're the only major, they're the only designer brand that's actually hoodwinked people to freely promote them by literally coating their bags with their, with their logo that you can't miss it. Everybody else is discreet. You know, you get a... You, you, you get a um, a Gucci top or something like that. It's going to have a little Gucci sign. I mean, because Adidas and Nike, and the, the, they're the ones who are loud and, you know, for the inner city people, right? They're, they're the ones who, you know, who are for people who don't have another identity. 
So they need an identity, right? So they give them identity. But designer brands are very subtle. They're, they're more about elegance. They're more, well, they're supposed to be. But Louis Vuitton's managed to, you know, get you to pay three, four hundred pounds for a bag and promote them, right? You can't miss it. So he said, not Louis Vuitton. Right. Who, who was that? I'm not talking about that companion, but anyway. So he says, I want everything. Going back to the companion story, he says, I want everything of mine to be beautiful. Is that arrogance? So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, that's not arrogance. Arrogance is that you deny the truth when you see it. You know, you see the truth and you deny it. You're obstinate, you're stubborn, and you look down upon people. So if, you, if, you're good, if your great features and handsomeness or whatever you have that you own makes you look down upon others, then that's a problem. But if you do it just that I want to be nice, then that's fine. A person came, was sitting in front of the great Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, and he was very scruffy looking. So Imam Abu Hanifa, after the class had ended, after everybody had gone away, he told him to stay back. And when he was with him in private, he spoke to him, he, he pulled out some money. He says, here, aslih hala, go and sort yourself out. Like go, you know, go and buy some decent clothing so you're not all scruffy in the way you're dressed. And he said, I've got money. I don't need this, I've got money. So, why are you dressing in a way that makes people feel sorry for you? In fact, there's a hadith, another hadith, which says that Allah likes to view, Allah likes that His bounties that he has provided to his servants be manifest on them I mean that in, in a moderate sense you, you know what I, what I mean by that the, um, he, if Allah has given us something then don't be greedy don't be miserly because that's a problem as well and um, dress well enough dress elegant but not pompously not arrogantly so that's in terms of dress and so on, which is something that we relate to every day. I mean, everybody talks about this thing. They may not talk about calligraphy. They may not talk about architecture. But otherwise, if we now move on to more uh, to other subjects, the Muslims have always been looking for elegance. Now, I know that if we look back for some of us from certain cultures, our cultures will differ hugely. Some of us may come from cultures that are not as clean as other cultures. I've been to some cultures where even the lowest person on the social rung, right, on the lowest rung of the social ladder, the person who is selling just literally juice on the street, is just peddling small amounts of things from a little cart, as, as you see in, in many developing and third world countries, they will be very clean. Even such a person will wear an apron and they will be very clean, though he's probably hardly getting by. But there's a concept of cleanliness. Yet some of our cultures that I'm sure you know, many of us relate to, it's very dirty. Right? The, 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 the cleanliness is not the same. That's a cultural thing. But otherwise, Islam is extremely, extremely um, emph emph emphasizes huge amount of cleanliness and nadafa. The Prophet ﷺ said that, At-tahuru uh, shatrul iman, purity is half of faith. Half of faith. But again, we're not just talking about physical purity. We're talking about the purity of the heart. I mean, if that's not half of the faith, then, you know, it's probably even more than half the faith in that sense. Because if you've got pure, if some person has purity of the heart, then everything else follows. Purity of self, purity of mind, purity of focus, purity of state, purity of akhlaq and character. And then, of course, physical purity to stay away from filth and so on. That's why we have the idea that the, the, the toilets are the place for the shaitan. And that's why when we go in, we pray the dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubthi wal khaba'ith. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from male and female devils that may dwell therein, in, in, in dirty places. Dirt is related to the devil uh, in, our, in our tradition. <clears throat> now, while we had prohibition for a number of things, we had a prohibition for generally instrumental music beyond the drum and beyond the tambourine in the Shafi school. Yeah, there's those two opinions. But beyond that, generally there's been a, 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 dis, a discouragement to music. There's been a discouragement to any kind of animate uh, form, depiction. So once the Prophet ﷺ came into his house and there, there was a, 
um, there was something hanging on the wall, a piece of cloth hanging on the wall, which seemed to have a, some kind of embroidery, it seemed, of a bird or something. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he, he was quite upset with that. He says, Jibreel, the angel will not come in if this is the case. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تدخل, بي... لا, لا تدخل ملائكة بيت فيه سور that the angels don't enter a room or a house in which there's forms, there's animate forms. Now this didn't stop the Taj Mahal from being built. And I, I visited the Taj Mahal at least, I think more than once. And unfortunately I haven't been able to actually admire it properly. I mean the bit that I have seen was amazing. But then I was told afterwards, I went to uh, one of the local uh, one of the local schools afterwards and I met uh, one of the principals of that place and he said he was once given a tour of that of the Taj Mahal right which is in Agra in India and that was just something that this king who was in very he was very romantic he was in love with his wife and he built this for there as a mausoleum so I mean we're, we're, we're talking about just the mausoleum here that he built and it's quite amazing so essentially everything in there has a, is very nuanced, everything in there from the calligraphy, the wording, the verses that have been picked in the calligraphy to how the placement is. So for example, there's an arch and the verse, I can't remember which verse it is now, but the verse that's there is speaking about height, the height of God, the, the God being elevated and that particular word comes right at the top. So it's very, very properly designed, thought out. They had the best people to do this. And that's just the Taj Mahal. There's numerous buildings like this. If you look at the Jamit Mosque of Delhi itself, if I just focus on India for a moment, and then when you go to Turkey, it's an open air museum, right? You just go around and you see those mosques that are in Turkey. <clears throat> then you go to places like, I mean, I, I would say one of the one of the best manifestations of Islamic architecture that I have seen is in Andalusia, which is in Cordoba. Uh, actually, more in particular, I think the Alhambra palaces. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Everything down to the inscriptions on the wall, which have still lasted, to the gardens that are outside. I mean, some of you may have been to those huge gardens outside the Alhambra palace and the various different palaces within that whole complex. It's absolutely amazing, even after several hundred years. Can you imagine what it was at the time? So Islam has never, <clears throat> I mean Muslims have never kept back just because of this. They would then combine within that the calligraphy, the art of calligraphy. The art of calligraphy is, I mean, that it's very difficult to speak about that. It's something that you need to see. The ability of words to be inscripted and written in a particular way to just amaze people. And, um, you know, you go to Turkey in places like that and you see that it's, I mean, you, you'll, you'll see calligraphy everywhere. But a lot of our art had to do with calligraphy. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough people studying this anymore. We don't have enough uh, calligraphers. Um, th there are some wonderful, worldly renowned ones, but otherwise we don't have enough. So we need more, we need more calligraphers. Then... <clears throat> We move on to poetry was another wonderful expression of art and that starts right from the time the Prophet <clears throat> Poetry may have been seen as a mundane aspect. Can you say poetry is religious was a, was a very important question. Can you say poetry is a religious idea? Because poetry is a vehicle, it's a medium, it's a <clears throat> it's the way of conveying information. But the Prophet ﷺ knew how powerful it was. Because in his time, it was poetry which was one of the most effective meads or mediums of, uh, uh, of, uh, of communication. And in, when, when, when you had things like battles raging, in the midst of a battle, they would actually start poetry. And that would be to get people going. Because people were riled up with poetry and, you know, people who appreciate poetry, it's like you get <clears throat> a whole hour's effective lecture and you reduce that to a few lines 
of really intense poetry. It's like Red Bull, right? Instead of 10 cans of Coke, you take a Red Bull. It's just like you're getting it all together at one go. It's very effective because poetry is really, really abbreviated, concise, lucid, very comprehensive form of speech using every strategy that you can, every technique within the language to deliver a meaning. And if you look at the <clears throat> Muslim poets, it's absolutely amazing. I'll just give you one quick, uh, uh, one quick example of that as we, as we go along. Be before I give you that example, let me, let me just answer the question that I raised. The Prophet ﷺ allowed that because that was an effective mode of communication. So for example, we had Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. He was known to be a poet par excellence. So he was actually sat onto the member of the Prophet ﷺ to defend Islam, defend the Muslims. Because after one of the battles, the, 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 the non-Muslims from Mecca, right, they started saying, after the battle of Uhud, they started saying some uh, poetry to say that, you know, we, we, we have the gods of Lat and Uzza and so on, and you guys have no god and so on. So Hassan ibn Thabit and others, they, they, were, they were responding to that. And that was the best way to respond in those days. So the Prophet ﷺ allowed that to happen because it was an important aspect. Not just was it an art, but it was a very effective form of art. Numerous people have resorted to poetry. There was one of the great scholars of, one of the great scholars of uh, Damascus. You've heard of Salahuddin Ayyubi and Nuruddin Zangi. So Salahuddin Ayyubi's um, mentor, the one who set things up for him, was Nuruddin Zangi. Right? May God bless them. Nuruddin Zangi was the one who established one of the first madrasas, um, universities, uh, de uh, dedicated to hadith studies called Darul Hadith and Nuriya in Damascus. Right? I don't know if it still exists. I don't, I don't know. I, I didn't know about this when I was studying in Damascus, so I didn't go to look for it. But it's such an amazing place. The first, one of the first teachers there was Ibn Asakir. And Ibn Asakir, a Dimashqi, wrote a book that I, we've just received recently. It's 80 volumes. And this is no joke. It's an 80 volume book on the history of Damascus, all the way from discussing those prophets who had come into Damascus. Actually, go, uh, it talks about the Roman you know, origins of Damascus and so on. Goes on and discusses pretty much any scholar or any person of repute within the city that lived until his time. And he died in 579, if I'm correct, right? which is just after Ghazali. So he's got everybody that came into Damascus and discussed. That's 80 volume that book is. And I, I can show you a picture of it. I've got it on my phone. Right? Now what's very interesting is that Ibn Asakir, he would, uh, he, would, he would have lessons. Salahuddin would attend his lessons. And Nuruddin Zangi, even the, the ruler, they would attend the lessons. At the end of every lesson, he would, he would have poetry. He was a poet. And that's when he would deliver his poetry at the end of each lesson. J just an additional point, it's got nothing to do with our topic today. Uh, but that is the same institution from which some of the greatest of our scholars that most of you would have heard of, of have come from. So the graduates of that place, I'll start with Imam Mizzi. You may have not heard of Imam Mizzi, but he's one of the great Hadith scholars. Imam Nawawi, he graduated there. Most people have heard of Imam Nawawi, Riyadh Salihin. Ibn Kathir, the great Mufassir of the Qur'an, one of the most famous tafsirs, he graduated there. Ibn Taymiyyah gradu graduated from there. Ibn Al-Qayyim, his, his student, Ibn Al-Qayyim, he graduated from there. So you've had some of the top scholars graduating from this place. And the reward is all being received by Nuruddin Zangi because he set it up. So anyway, that was a side point. So whether you look at poetry, whether you look at architecture, whether you look at calligraphy, it's pretty much the Muslim world has, mashallah, in all forms of art because we had a prohibition of music. So instead of music, we've got tajweed of the Qur'an. And the wonderful thing about tajweed is that it's a miracle. It's part of being a miracle of the Qur'an because the Qur'an is a miracle and tajweed is that. I'm trying to, I try to choose the most simplest name for my children as well. My first child, his name is... Hudayfa. So 
So it's got a ha and it's got a dhal. Most people are going to say huzaifa. So they're going to say a small ha and a, and a za instead of a dhal. So nobody's going to say his name right. right? Second one, Aisha. Again, very difficult because you have to say the ain. Who's going to say, you know, not everybody's an Arab, not everybody can say an ain. They're going to say Aisha, 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 right? Becomes a Y eventually, right? So then I thought, then Yusuf. Now you can't really mess up Yusuf. It's a very simple spelling, sp simple way of saying it. And my last one is Salim. So I'm trying to find names that are not going to get messed up because language changes over time, right? Let's start on surnames. What's your surname? Sorry? Tarafdar. Now that, even the way you're saying it, right, that's Taraf Dar. That sounds like a Persian, it sounds, it's Persian, right? Urdu Persian? Okay, all right. Um, what's your name? Alvi what? Right, so Alvi is actually messed up already. It's from Alawi, right? It's a nisba to Al. Now, you spell it A-L-V-I, right? There's no V in Arabic. There's no V in Urdu either, right? But somehow, when you're putting it into English, it becomes Alvi, right? It's actually supposed to be Alawi, Ain Lam Wow, right? So that I would spell that as an A-L-W-I. So it's actually become Alvi, right? So give it a few more generations and it'll probably go through some more evolution, right? Just like that, everything that... Now imagine if the Qur'an was allowed to evolve that way. It, it would really corrupt the meaning. But that's why it doesn't matter which country you're from, whether you speak Arabic or not, what, whatever slang Arabic you, you, you're used to, when you read the Qur'an, you could be in, from any country... But the rules are universal. And you could be Shia, Sunni, whatever you are. It doesn't make a difference. You must read the Quran. You might say it with a slight Turkish accent. Assalamu alaikum. Right? Um, um, instead of Assalamu alaikum. Right? You might do that. But other than that, you know, the Tajweed is right. It's just there how much you're supposed to stretch it. There's nothing else. I mean, if you look at English, it's not like that. There's so many different words that you say differently. For example, we say yogurt. In America, they say yogurt, tomato, right? Toma tomato. Totally different. Even in England, things change. Right? For example, who's from anybody from Walsall? Right? They'll actually say, I'm from Wusu. Right? I'm not from Walsall, I'm from Wusu. Right? Things change like that, they differ. But when it comes to the Qur'an, it's a miracle. The Qur'an and the way people read it, and the way people listen to it, there's so many people around the world who absolutely have no idea what the reciter is saying, which is unfortunate, but they will listen to them for endless hours. And it's just voice, there's no music, it's just pure a cappella, right? There's no music to it at all. So, these are the various different forms of expression, which are not prohibited. We've got some prohibitions. But it's never stopped anybody from building wonderful buildings, depicting art that has literally remained for a timeless age, and people are, I mean, benefiting from it even until today. Right? Wherever you go around in the Muslim world and other places, we ask Allah that Allah allow us to, inshallah, contribute to this as well. Uh, but to but to finish off and then to answer any specific questions that you have, um, I would just say that the main thing that we need to worry about when it comes to um, universities and student life, just to briefly discuss that, is that when you get engrossed in anything, you then take on the climate, uh, the, the environment, the, the culture of the, pe of the people you're sitting with. There's a certain climate in any university that you go to. I don't, I don't know enough about Oxford to, to uh, what do you call it, to make any uh, assessment here. But I've been to one university in London where I've gone to give a talk like this and it's just a rowdy bunch. Right? It's just, um, you find it difficult to speak to them because at any little thing they start giggling. 
right? They start laughing and it just it's just kind of crazy. You go to, there's another university that I really like going to. And when you go there, mashallah, they're all very serious and they, 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 there's a certain culture in every university. I'm assuming that in Oxford it's quite serious. Now, while it's being serious, alhamdulillah, you're not going to be wasting time, hopefully. Otherwise, I mean, having gone through university myself, there's so many people who can actually go through university and pretty much just do a bit of work and get through and pass. Because at the end of the day, that's really all that matters, that at the end of the day, you pass your exam. And you could be wasting a huge amount of time. So, in all of that, how do you remain close to your faith? Because there's a lot of pressure on people as well. Because we live in a very socially challenging time. The, the millennial generation that uh, people are you know, finding themselves in is without any fault of our own, right? Um, it's not, no fault of yours or anybody else's that you came and we came, we happen to be here in this generation where the mobile phone was invented and it just creates this massive addiction problem. So I think one needs to just really be focused on what they want from this life and be goal-oriented. There's a talk I just gave two weeks ago in Imperial College, something to do with vision, being a visionary or whatever. So it just gives you, uh, you know, I've, I, I did a survey of uh, what the classical scholars thought about that. So to give you one example, uh, you had the great leader of the Muslims, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was actually a playboy before. He would never wear a garment twice. He would never like to be publicly seen in the same garment. Once he's worn it once, he would never want to see it being worn uh, the second time. But when he became, he, he was then the governor of Medina Munawwara, the Khilafah, the, the head, uh, the capital was Damascus. That's where the Umayyads were. He was a cousin of the ruling, uh, the, the Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and those guys who were the, uh, the Sultan. He was, the, he was uh, the governor, and then when his cousin, the sultan, passed away, his children were too young, so Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was called to become the khalif. He says afterwards, he says that, before I became governor, I used to have a desire that I'm going to be the governor of Medina Munawwara. A very ambitious person. And he says, then I became the governor. Then my ambition was that I'm going to become the khalif of the Muslims. I'm going to become the president. That was his ambition. And he says, then I became the khalif, the, the president. What do you think his next ambition is going to be? When you've done it, when you've been there and done that, what's your next ambition? Very career oriented, very ambition, huge vision. He says, when I became the khalif, then my next ambition became paradise. That's when you get it right. So what is your ambition? What is your ambition? Ambition has to be the hereafter. That is what distinguishes a believer from anybody else. Why? What does it mean by a believer? If you're believing in praying, you pray. That's, that's not a big deal. The belief is the belief, as Allah says in the beginning of the Quran, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those people who believe in the unseen. That is how strong we are on how strong strong our belief is in the unseen. Belief in the unseen doesn't mean that we just acknowledge, oh, there's going to be a paradise there or something like that. We'll deal with it when we get there. But it's about how strong that idea is in our mind and how that actually affects our life. So the example that I generally give is this. Those of you who are studying and have already figured out where you want to be living and where you want to buy a house, because I guess one of the big deals is that you finish, you get married, and then you get a house. I guess that's a big idea, right? That most people have. How many of you know where you want to buy your house and where you want to live and how much it costs and how you're going to get it? How many of you already thought, thought about that? Anybody? Just one person? Two people? Okay. Three, four. So you're, you're going to... Um, okay. Alhamdulillah. When you've figured it out, when you've planned way ahead of where you want to be five to ten years now, from now, your studies are going to be very different to those people who are just thinking, I need to spend these next three years. I just need to finish this place. That's not good enough. You're going to have to spend the next three or four years anyway. But why don't you 
have a goal that is five years beyond that. That's not going to affect this except positively. Remember that. Because then if you're only thinking about this time that, and, and there's nothing else that features in your future, then you, you could be wasting a huge amount of time now. But if your future is something else where you want to get somewhere, then your studies here are going to be targeted at that. And your studies will improve. Because if you really want that house and you really want to get married, you really want this, you really want, then this study needs to be much better. You need to work hard. So that's a simple idea, right? Same way, there are those people who live through this world, make a lot of effort and do everything like everybody else does. But their focus is Jannah. Their focus is the pleasure of Allah. This is just the part in between. This is just the means to get there. Just like university is not the be, end, be all or end all of everything, is it? It's just the tool that you're going through. But if you've made university your great ambition and goal, when you come out of here, you're going to be miserable. This is just a medium of development. That's it. It's just something you have to go through. Right? So same thing, if you think of the world as something like that, and our real abode is the hereafter, then your work in this world, you'll still enjoy yourself, but your work in this world will be totally different. Because you're working for a purpose now. You're not working just for the world. Just like here, you're not living just for now, but you're living for afterwards. You're spending your time here. And that's a simple equation. So everybody just think, where do I want to be in 10 years? Where do I want to be? Not just in career, but how close do I want to be to Allah? Because there are... Within the university, there are a lot of temptations. I mean, that's not something that anybody needs to, you know, try to, you know, uh, convince anybody about it. There's a lot of temptations. How do I get out of this place? How do I get married the day that I get married for those who are not married? And I can say to myself that I did not commit zina ever. And this is a, this has been pure. And I have excellence in this regard. And then one day I can meet with my Lord when I finish and I can say that Alhamdulillah at least I stayed away from X, Y and Z. Otherwise it's so easy. And I think the way to benefit from that inshaAllah is that if you just do a few things then I can guarantee you this is empirical, right? That if you do a few things your Iman will stay protected and your Iman level will stay at a certain balance. And that is you just do a hundred istighfar in the morning and evening. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhambi wa atubu ilayh or any other shorter istighfar morning and evening the benefit of it is that whatever sin that we've happened to commit we said something we saw something we, we heard something that we weren't supposed to then it gets forgiven so we're constantly cleaning ourselves it's like we're constantly washing ourselves right? so we're having two showers a day so in the morning everything we've done since night time it's purified we, we do a hundred in the evening again and then that's all of our day's problems all sorted inshallah so that now that we've gained purification, we need to adorn ourselves. One of the best ways to invoke blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to send blessings on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So do a hundred salawat on Rasulullah in the morning, a hundred in the evening. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Morning and evening. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever sends one blessing on me, God sends ten blessings on him. So that's mashallah. Hundred istighfar, a hundred salawat, morning and evening. Then once a day, read some Qur'an. Even if that's just one page of Qur'an a day. Whatever you can conveniently do every day. If that's two pages, if that's one page, just pick it up, read a page. The Qur'an is our lifeline. That is what fills the heart with light. That is what keeps you connected to Allah. Keeps you focused. So read the Qur'an preferably with meaning. Even if just one page a day. That's three things. Number four, is try to spend about 5 to 10 minutes a day, just 5 to 10 minutes, meditating just with Allah, nobody else. I know we pray, but a lot of time our prayers are distracted. So find 5 to 10 minutes for yourself, whether that be the last thing you do at night or first thing in the morning once you've done your Fajr prayer or whatever. Just sit down and do a sort of meditation. One of the ones that I found very effective is that you sit down, close your eyes, and you just imagine that Allah's mercy is descending on your heart. 
Right? So Allah's mercy, His rahmah is descending on your heart. Just imagine a shaft of light coming down on your heart and all of your darkness from your heart is being eliminated. And you do that for like a few moments and then the main thing is for the rest of the minutes you just say Allah, Allah with your heart. Just think of Allah with your heart. What does that mean? You can't think of Allah, we don't know what to think about because we don't know what He looks like. He's beyond form and so on. So what Allah says in the Quran is وَذْكُرِ اسْمَ Rabbik. Take the name of your Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. So all you do is you imagine that there's a board on your heart that says Allah. And you just, you just close your eyes and you're just imagining that your heart is beaming that out, like just pulsating with it. Allah, 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 without saying anything with your tongue. It's very powerful. And you'll know when you're doing it or you're not doing it because it's a massive, you're going you're gonna to have to learn focus because distraction is what's the killer of this. And we are in a distracted generation. So put your phones off and everything and then do it. Let's just do this for 30 seconds and I want to show you how hard it is. But if you get that right for 5 to 7 minutes, you will see the benefit of it. So lower your heads, close your eyes and just think with your heart that it's saying Allah, Allah and don't get distracted by anything. I'll tell you when, actually I'll give you 50 seconds. How many of you managed to pass all 50 seconds with no distraction at all? You didn't even hear that clock. You finally found out that that actually ticks. Right? Anybody? No distraction? Very difficult, isn't it? But if you can just focus on God, give Him that, which He deserves from us, away from all the other distractions of the world, the phone, the Facebook, the everything, Believe me, you will gain focus in your prayer. You'll, read, you'll do better in exams, to be honest, because you'll gain focus. Right? But the main thing is that we want it to enliven our heart because our hearts become diseased by all the corruption that we take in from around us. So anyway, quickly, um, number one was what? Istighfar. Number two was? Salawat, Durud Sharif. Number three, Quran. Number four, meditation. Number five is? When we first hear about this, then we get kind of like, okay, I need to do this. You do it for two, three days, and then after that, it starts dwindling because we've got too much competition in our life. There's too much other things that we need to happen, we need to do. So I'll do it later, I'll do it later, and eventually gets lost. So if you can, once a week, attend a gathering that makes you feel closer to Allah. Now, if that's difficult and you can't find such, I'm not talking about an Isaac um, meeting. Those are good. They're for a different purpose, though, right? That's management. I'm talking about something that just reminds you of God. If you can't do that, find lectures that will do that for you. At least once a week, listen to those. And you will see, inshallah, that if you try this for, th for three weeks and you don't feel close to Allah, then I don't know what to say. It's empirical. This is scientific. If you do this for three weeks with iman in your heart, you will feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it will be easier for you to do things. So anyway, I end there inshallah. Um, I hope I've um, answered all those other questions as well, at least briefly. Uh, of course, we've got, uh, I, I mean, I've dealt with these subjects quite a few times and there's quite a few lectures on zamzamacademy.com for these if I've not been able to fully answer your questions for you. Um, but I didn't want to get our brother upset because his focus was the arts, right? So uh, I wanted to cover the arts anyway. Um, yes, so that's the talk ended. If anybody's got any questions about anything, please, I'm here for a few more moments. Yeah, you see, the, what, what helped me a lot with that is a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu said, الْغِنَاءُ um, يُنْبِتُ النِّفَاقَ فِي الْقَلْبِ كَمَا يُنْبِتُ الْمَاءُ الزَّرُ uh, Music is what creates uh, hypocrisy in the heart, just as water... Um, uh, what do you call it, grows uh, crops. So music is a feeding in the heart uh, through... The, the idea is that you are becoming... You are uh, the, the whole idea that I see from there is that you are becoming too accustomed to an artificial form of, uh, of, uh, uh, of stimulation. Right, so music is just it, it's very powerful. In, in fact, according to studies, it shows that music... Uh, is one of the most powerful things that you can find. It's more powerful in terms of the effect it creates on a person. You know, the 
uh, I forget what it's called, when, when you get excited, a huge amount of pleasure, there's something that happens at the back of your neck, so they gauge that. And they've measured a number of things. They say it ranks even higher than sexual intercourse, fulfillment, sexual fulfillment. It ha uh, music can rank even higher than sexual fulfillment, the excitement that you get from it. So it's very powerful. It can make you sad, it can make you excited, it can make you run, it can make you dance. It can make, it's very powerful. And I think that's the, that's the thing that I see is the problem. That's the very thing which I think is the problem. Because then you, you get accustomed to that, then you need to have more of it and more of it and different forms of it, right? And gets more intense and more intense. But it's all artificial. And as you know, with everything else, the, the deen just hates artificia artificiality. It just wants real substance. So get used to real uh, substance in terms of words and uh, the Quran and, and so on. Otherwise, that's what you're going to be excited by. Then eventually they start, I mean, I, I heard uh, somebody had sent me something about an adhan that was accompanied by music. And adhan is supposed to be a music of its own, right, without instruments. But somebody had thought this is necessary, that it's not good enough. So music is extremely contagious in that sense. That's what I personally see as the wisdom behind it. That's why um, you have so much discouragement for it. Abdullah ibn Umar was with Salim, I think, and uh, suddenly music started playing. So he put his hand on his ear and he told the young boy, he said, when it finishes, let me know, right? And he said, this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did with me when I was young. So there's a lot of discouragement for it in that sense. I know, I know there's a lot of justifications out there because we've got Muslim nasheed artists that are, you know, using it for... So the example I gave of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, <clears throat> I was just saying that he was lucky. He was lucky that he had a very, uh, very worldly career oriented idea first. So he wanted to be the governor, then he wanted to be the khalif. But when he became the khalif, then he was lucky that Allah had mercy on him and gave him the right goal to look for. Do you see what I'm saying? So. The example that I gave, that if you're in university and you've got a goal post-university, then your university will be better. Because you're probably then going to choose the right subject based on that goal. You're then going to be working and maybe doing extracurricular activities based on that goal. So now if we make the goal satisfaction of God, getting His pleasure and paradise, then anything we do in the world we're going to try to make that conducive to that plan and that vision. So automatically things will fall in place. But there are, there's ways you have to go about doing that. If we don't have enough knowledge by ourselves as to which subject should I be getting into in the first place, right? Which will be, condu for example, I've got a friend, uh, maybe I'll send it to, uh, maybe I'll, we'll send you the link. I've got a friend in University of Chicago. Now, he's a path he was doing medicine in the Pritzker school there, right? University of Chicago is one of the top universities of America, right? He, take, he took off about three or four years to go and study in Pakistan. He became a scholar, right? He came back and uh, he carried on and then he had to choose a vocation. Now, he as a scholar said that if I'm going to become a normal doctor, I'm going to have to deal with, interact with a lot of patients. And the problem with that is that there's going to be a lot of intergender, relation, intergender interaction that I'm going to have to undertake, which he's not very happy in doing. Because it's, you know, there's temptation within that. So he chose, for his purpose, he chose pathology. Right? Because it's very lab-oriented. Right? He's just looking at tissue and stuff like that. Right? So that was a conscious choice he made. Now, I know, not, you know we don't want to fill up the labs with just Muslims, but <laughs> you, you know what I mean, right? This is a very personal choice that he had. So when you have that kind of a goal in mind, you will make less mistakes. Your choices will be better. But to get those choices right, you need to ask the right people, to consult the right people. You need to make istikhara. So there's a process involved. It's not as simply as, okay, Jannah's my goal, but I don't know how to get there. You know, you're going to have to ask the right people, others who've done it, find out what accidents there you know what, what what are the pitfalls what are the obstacles and so on and so forth so it's kind of a more holistic system it's not just as simple as having a goal there's things that it will uh, that you have to put into place with that um so the journal has just done a feature on him 
See, when he studied in Pakistan, one of the Maulanas at the madrasa he was studying at, he would just come and he, uh, the, the Sheikh Hussein, he was actually quite fascinated by how this particular old Sheikh would come and distill huge amounts of information in the simplest form and present it to the students. It would be very easy for them to understand. When he came back to university, he saw that it was just too complex. And they were just, he, 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 he was quite inspired by his Arabic teacher. So he started thinking, how can I take all of this instruction and simplify it? And that's exactly what he worked on to do. Then he started teaching for Kaplan. Do you know Kaplan? Right, that um, uh, training uh, program. Now in America, to get into medical school, you have to do a, a medical entry exam. It's just all big money making. Um, I, 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 was, I wanted to go into law school, so I had to do the LSAT. And to do training for that LSAT, I had to pay, I think it was eleven or $1,300 just for the training. To train, to pass an exam, to get into law school. It's just all money making. To get a transcript in America from your university costs money. To make an application to a university costs between seventy and one hundred and fifty dollars. That was ten years ago, right? America's just crazy. It's all about money, right? Because I lived there for eight years. Um, so anyway, he di he discovered that you know he's very good at this. So he's now started his own what they call pathoma.com website, in which he gives this instruction to pathology students. And he's a guy who goes into university with a topi on, like a typical white hat. And a lab coat. He's like a big beard, dopey, you know, the hat. And that's how he w works there. But they're raving about him. He's got a whole fan club. And he's a very humble man. I know he's a very close friend of mine. He's very humble, right? But they've got a whole fan club that are making T-shirts and everything on his name because they love his course. Right? He's just simplified pathology, the instruction in pathology, to such a degree that people have just passed their test because of it. Because of what he learned in the madrasa. So, what I'm saying is that when you've got a focus and a goal, God will then also open up pathways for you. Because Allah says in the Quran, those who make an effort in my way, I will open up the ways for them. It requires, it requires tawakkul and reliance. It's not like you put money in a bank and you see the interest rise. That's quite obvious. This is like when Allah says, give one pound in the path of Allah and I'll give you 70 back. How? Right? How are you going to get 70 back? You don't see it. It doesn't come in your balance. But God, God does give it to you. That's why we need Iman Bil Ghaib. Very important. So thanks for that question. That was an important question. So yes, there's a whole... Uh, it's not just the vision, but there's a whole you know, process that has, to be, that has to go with it. All right. Jazakallah khair.